West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Republicans have been conspicuously quiet about the MAGA Republican federal judge's ruling in validating the FDA's approval of the abortion medication Mifepristone. Only one Republican senator has publicly crowed about it, Mississippi's Cindy Hyde-Smith. The silence is probably because they know it's wildly unpopular, so much so that it has enraged a part of their supposed pro-business party base, Big Pharma. Hundreds of industry executives signed on to an open letter blasting Judge Matthew Kaczmarek, saying the ruling ignores science, undermines the FDA's authority, and creates uncertainty for the entire industry. Of course, the Republican trademark is being out of touch on, well, everything, abortion, democracy, guns, LGBTQ issues, you name it. Today, the LGBTQ advocacy group Equality Florida issued a warning about travel or moving to the state warning of risks to health, safety, and freedom moving through its legislature under the Ron DeSantis regime. It comes days after a Florida Republican state representative had to apologize for an extravagantly offensive rant during a hearing where he called transgender people demons and imps. I'm looking at society today and it's like I'm watching an X-Men movie. It's like we have mutants living among us on planet Earth. I'm a proud Christian conservative Republican. I'm not on the fence. Mm, Christian conservative Republican, that tracks. Meanwhile, in Missouri, House Republicans are taking their culture wars to a chilling extreme. They voted Tuesday to strip all state funding from public libraries, purely out of spite. They did it because Missouri librarians are suing the state over a law that has led to the banning of 300 books, many of them, unsurprisingly, authored by or telling stories about people of color and LGBTQ people. Join me now is MSNBC political analyst and former Senator Claire McCaskill. And Claire, I mean, you now have to have, to have travel advisories in Florida. And Missouri Republicans are saying, we're going to defund the libraries. Make it make sense. Well, it's very hard to. Um, you know, absolute power not only corrupts, but it also produces really extreme viewpoints. When you think you are absolutely free of any threat, other than from someone further to more extreme than you are, then you go for it. And in Missouri, we have a trifecta going in this legislative session. First, we have the fact that they have passed the most restrictive abortion law in the country from conception no exceptions. Rape victims are forced to give birth in the state of Missouri if they are impregnated by the criminal who attacked them. Second, they voted, Joy, to let children openly carry weapons, AR-15s, and now they've defunded all public libraries because someone had the nerve to use our Constitution to assert themselves in a court of law to determine the limits of the First Amendment. 
So, I mean, it is really nuts and it is hard to watch for me because I'm a former member of the Missouri legislature back when there were conservative people and there were liberal people and then there were a whole lot of people that figured out how they could talk to each other. Not anymore. It is one way road to the most extreme positions you can possibly imagine. And the only way to fix it is for the people to vote. Well, and the thing is, you make that point because, you know, back in, when Tennessee had an all Democratic legislature, there were stories of sort of they, they went too far in some ways, you know, wielding their power of Republicans. Having absolute power, as you said, is always corrupting for whichever party. You know, it, this isn't a partisan statement. It's just you give people that much power. Let me play you a soundbite, which is stunning. This is a, a conversation between State Senator Mike Moon um, and a Democratic representative about something, as you said, you want to talk about extremism? This is about whether children, babies, should be allowed to be raped and then married by adults. Take a listen. I've heard you talk about parents' rights to raise their kids how they want. In fact, I just double checked. You voted no on making it illegal for kids to be married to adults at the age of 12 if their parents consented to it. You said actually that should be the law because it's the parents' right and the kids' right to decide what's best for them to be raped by an adult. Okay? Do you know any kids who have been With married marriage. at age 12? That any, was the law. You, know you voted kids? not to change it. Do you know any kids who have been married at age 12? I, I, I don't need to. I do. Uh, and guess what? They're still married. I, I don't even know what to do with that, Claire. I don't even know what to do with it. Yeah. Um, it is... Um, so disgusting and it's embarrassing for me and millions of other Missourians who are so sad that this man not only was he a state representative he got elected to the Senate he represents over a hundred thousand people in a, a rural part of our state so and by the way a lot of these bills I just talked about joy the ones that are so extreme many of them are pushed by people that had no opponent last election that's right Mm -hmm. So one of the things I think we don't talk about enough on many of the wonderful programs I am blessed to appear on is telling people it is more than just going on Twitter. It is more than talking about it with your family, your friends, the people who agree with you. It is about running and registering people to vote. And I think it's important to point out that school boards, city councils, state legislative seats, county commissions, those races can be won with shoe leather. You can knock on doors. You can meet your voters. You don't have to have a gajillion dollars. You don't have to have some fancy photograph or video or commercial. All you have to do is get out there and meet people and say, do you really want our state to be represented by people who think it's okay for 12 year olds to marry adults? Is that a good idea? If more of us would do that, Take up the passion you feel and run and register other people to vote. I think that's the only way we check this kind of power run amok that is doing these culture wars that really are hurting people. You, you are speaking my language, uh, my good sister, because that I literally I am a broken record on this, that I think people have difficulty connecting voting and elections all up and down the ballot to preventing people like this from having power. Representative Clay Higgins of Louisiana says that over time, American communities will build beautiful church-owned public access libraries. Churches will. I'm gonna help these churches get funding. We will change the whole public library paradigm. The library's regular Americans recall are gone. They've become liberal grooming centers. If you think that sounds bonkers, don't think for a second that that person will not enact that. Because as you said, Claire, he will run unopposed. The people who think that's crazy won't vote. The young people will march, but nece not necessarily vote. And a lot of people will get hurt simply because, I mean, DeSantis only won because 1.3 million Floridians stayed home. That's the thing that drives me nuts. It is Thursday, the 13th of April of 2023. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya. A little bit of spice in your life. Oh, it is spicy. Getting spicier, I guess uh, Trump 
is uh is he in New York al- already or are they still preparing for his impending uh deposition in another fraud trial he's got quite a few of them going on you know he took office after paying a 20 25 million somewhere around there could have just been a measly 23 mil uh for his Trump University fraud people forget that <laughs> he's been a fraudster from way back. I don't know how this guy got elevated to the climbs that he is uh, have it, has attained, but I would uh, take uh, maybe TV producers and put them on uh, on trial. How was it that you picked this guy? The one who's been compromised by the KGB, and then what came after? You know, the founders did say that uh, you can't really trust these really buco rich guys. They have no national allegiance. They have only an allegiance to their own pocketbook at the expense of your freedom, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Yep, they want to be protected to take your property. And don't you forget it. Your property could be something as simple as your voice. The Cornish have a saying that the tongueless man gets his land took. Uh huh. Speech, property, speech, personal autonomy. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to have a federal judge somewhere, or not even a federal judge, maybe just a district judge. Could be anywhere. Could be like Judge Roy Bean in some backwaters in Nowhereville's USA. Who can pass down an edict that you don't get the medicine that would uh, stop that staph infection because they don't believe that God intended us to uh, fight these life forms. Mm -hmm. Because what is life? Apparently in America, life is what uh, the people with all the guns say it is. They can take it. And they can let you keep living. Mm -hmm. Now that is being God. They are gods now. Never had to study for it. All they had to do was amass an armory. We do have solutions to this problem. And it doesn't involve only punching the Nazis. Though that's part of it. And by punching the Nazis, you know what I mean. It's very nuanced. It means a lot of different things. It means punching them in the pocketbook. It means punching them in the ballot box. It means punching them... I don't know. (laughs) I could go Winston Churchill. But uh, punch a Nazi today. Punch a Nazi tomorrow. Punch a Nazi forever! Say that from the schoolhouse steps and see where it gets you. In today's new Agogo society in Goose Step and USA... I know not everybody. That's why we are the resistance. Isn't it funny how the people who, like us, who, you know, apparently have a bit of compassion and empathy for our fellows, who would, you know, help somebody up off the street because, well, I don't know, they've been cut off at the knees. And somehow we're the evil ones. You're helping a mutant, an imp. Remember that? Yeah, an imp. All right. I don't really want to have superstition ruling our lives. And when I say our lives, I mean kind of like me. I'm kind of selfish of this. How dare some idiotic ideologue out there in Amarilla say that, um, you know, in our quest to destroy the administrative state, just, uh, you know, some people are going to have to, well, die. It's the price to be paid for liberty. And yet, our idea of liberty means that people don't die for it necessarily unless, you know, you're attacked over it, and that's exactly what they're doing to us right now. Decades and decades and decades of doing this. 
Federalist Society judges deciding, oh, well, we're not going to adhere to this administrative state on the Clean Water Act. Just get rid of it. We don't need that. Wetlands, we don't need that. 25 inches of rain falling in a part of, uh, what was it Fort Lauderdale, Florida? Is that where it was? 25, 27 inches of rain in 24 hours. What is the Republican solution to this? Burn more fossil fuels. The only way to stop climate change is to burn more fossil fuels. The only way to stop these school shootings is to give everybody a gun. Ah, More guns, more guns. It's almost as if they're chaos agents and they have a vested interest in making as much chaos as possible so they can hold on to whatever it is they think is power. I mean, we saw these science fiction movies, even in the 1950s, B-grade ones, they address these issues. You got a bunch of people who say when, you know, the shit comes down and chaos is everywhere, I'm going to make sure that I get mine and screw you. Versus, I don't know, the neo-romantics out in the middle of the apocalyptic desert and uh, the road warrior is being uh, uh, chased by whatever those guys were, the wild things. We've come to steal you know, what little petrol you have left for our muscle car gas guzzlers here in the apocalyptic desert with nothing around. But they were, you know, the neo-romantics were running a small refinery. Okay, let's be clear about this. <sighs> you know, an updated version might have them using some sort of rare earth minerals to make batteries. So there'd be that. But yeah, you know, the host of uh, a little enclave of neo-romantics uh, hoping to find paradise out there on the beach somewhere. They got a map and a postcard. A dream of a better future. And they're being attacked because they're just trying to help each other and help people along the way. All right. I built my bomb shelter. You didn't build yours. Suffer in the nuclear fire. Okay, thanks. Thanks, neighbor. Anytime you need to borrow a cup of sugar, I'm right here. All right. Well, what else is happening out there in the world? Everything. (laughs) Everything is happening in the world, and we we really had had to, you know... uh, put ourselves in the bubble, so to speak, so that we can give you a curated show here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy as we begin in this fabulous bistro cafe part of said establishment. And as we begin on this menu here, (laughs) the Biden administration has proposed a HIPAA rule update to protect the privacy of abortion seekers and physicians and just in time, too. The charge debate on the Oregon gun safety bills is a microcosm of the national divide. And the Department of Agriculture wants U.S. meat processors to make sure they are not using child labor. You have to be told. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Switzerland's lower house of parliament issued a searing rebuke of an emergency plan to rescue Credit Suisse. And the president of Colombia removed the national police director who talked about using exorcisms to catch fugitives. (laughs) All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
Radio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link. And the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln, who will be attending Netroots Nation in Chicago this year. So thank you, Kelly, for everything that you do. Across the page to the left from that chat room link and down just a skosh, because that's how we speak around here, is the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, it really does help. And I won't go into the whole spiel about how you could, uh, you know, send us the money you might spend on an on espresso-type coffee drink once a month. And I won't uh, bother uh, wasting your time telling you that uh, that gets pooled with other like-minded folks so that we can pay our bills and all the other charges and fees and whatnot that are accrued while trying to run this powerhouse of resistance as we've been uh, resisting for for over uh, 12 years now, a dozen years. Wow. Okay. Well, we're not media moguls, but we have a mission. And thank you for allowing us to fulfill our civic duty as the founders originally intended. So I won't bother you with all that spiel. So anyway, thank you for your generosity. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, Mastodon, and Spoutable, that is very simple. You just go to at Netroots Radio, wherever you are. And Tom takes care of those. And thank you, Tom. And he does a hell of a lot more as well around here. You could follow me on Twitter, Mastodon, and Spoutable at Justice Putnam. And I'll tell you why. Because I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime. And uh, that's just a reminder that uh, you could go to the actual <laughs> diary on Daily Co's if you go to those social media feeds because it, the, uh, the links are there. Sometimes I'll, I'm a little late on the draw and don't get the actual day's show notes and links up until I get the podcast diary out. And that could be hours later. I'm sorry. It's really busy around here since uh, I've had... I've had to be more hands-on in my mom's care. Uh, I Oh, let me tell you, she's doing so much better, but she did take a tumble the other day, and I may have mentioned that she has gossamer thin skin, and it tears quite easily. So uh, she did tear this. Uh, I, we thought maybe she might have bounced her head, but fortunately she didn't. Uh, she was bending over to clean the floor for some reason because her little rat dog which is uh, uh, what we call, or what I call, as a term of endearment, the the little Yorkshire that she has. And uh, it's turned into a yapping dog. But that that little dog has gotten you know so old, and so she's getting a little bit feeble and drops her food and whatnot. So my dear mom decided that after having a congenital heart failure that she would put her head below her knees. Don't do that. You will faint. <laughs> and she she started to. And uh, that's why it's good to be nearby because one can then immediately attend to her needs. And that's sometimes what needs to be done around here now. And that's OK. That's what I'm here for. It's why I came up here and uh, found the plot of land. Uh, and this is what we're doing anyway. Um, that's the excuse for not getting the show notes and links diary up sometimes until the podcast diary comes out. Now you can also follow the show on Twitter and I apologize for not taking time to really expand that on Twitter. You can find uh, the show on Twitter at cookbook West, but I promise I will take better care and I will also get us on over at Mastodon and spoutable as well. But most importantly, if you could pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, tune in, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, where, and wherever podcasts can be found, uh, that, that would be absolutely grand. So thank you for doing that as well. All right, this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy on this fabulous Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Oh, another reminder, my recipe for Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays uh, is is with the show notes and links, so I'm sorry. You'll get that one way or another. Uh, Rebecca Sager from the American Independent brings us this first offering. 
The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services announced plans yesterday, Wednesday, to update a landmark federal health privacy law to protect those who have abortions and the doctors that provide that care. A notice of proposed rulemaking announced in a statement posted to the department's website focuses on private reproductive health care information that could be used to criminalize or legally penalize abortion care. According to HHS, the measure would strengthen Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, otherwise known as HIPAA, that's the privacy rule protections, by prohibiting the use or disclosure of protected health information, that's called PHI, to investigate or prosecute patients, providers, and others involved in the provision of legal reproductive health care, including abortion care. HHS has heard from patients, providers, and organizations representing thousands of individuals that this change is needed to protect patient-provider confidentiality and prevent private medical records from being used against people for merely seeking, obtaining, providing, or facilitating lawful reproductive health care. The statement reads, Reproductive health care would be defined to include but not limited to prenatal care, abortion, miscarriage management, infertility treatment, contraception use, and treatment of reproductive-related conditions such as ovarian cancer. This is a critical step to help patients across the, our country get the re reproductive care they need with the knowledge that their privacy will be, be protected. Democratic Senator Patty Murray of Washington State, a senior member and former chair of the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor and Pensions, said in the statement, I push the Biden administration to a, update existing HIPAA regulations to strengthen our nation's health privacy protections as Republicans go after patients and providers in the wake of the Dobbs decision. And I am glad the administration is moving ahead with new protections to do just that. Politico reported that Vice President Kamala Harris planned to meet with the White House's Task Force on Reproductive Health Care Access to discuss the updates to HIPAA. Although HIPAA protects the privacy of a patient's health care information, it does not stop providers from sharing medical records with law enforcement. The new privacy measures would not change this and would not protect the health information of those who obtain an abortion in states where it is illegal, according to Axios. In the months that followed the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision that overturned Roe v. Wade, reproductive justice attorneys began counseling doctors and pregnant people about their rights. And in some cases, in preparation for potential lawsuits, law lawyers working on behalf of anti-abortion organizations filed preliminary petitions in order to question abortion fund groups and abortion providers and obtain medical information on reproductive care, the Texas Tribune reported. Politico reported that an unnamed senior official in the Biden administration told reporters, we found that even with the permissible disclosures policy, some providers get fearful when they receive a subpoena or they might feel like they have to turn the information over. In reference to abortion seekers, the, the unnamed official added, they're scared. They're concerned about the medical information being misused and disclosed. As a result, individuals may hesitate to interact with providers, health plans, pharmacies, or related health applications out of fear that their data will be tracked or shared inappropriately. The proposal follows the unprecedented decision on April 7th by a federal judge in Texas to stay the FDA's approval two decades ago of the abortion medication Mifepristone.
Andrew Zelski of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. An emotionally charged debate over Oregon's gun-related legislation recently brought lawmakers on different sides of the issue near tears, reflecting a passionate divide over gun rights that is also being played out nationwide. One of the most sweeping bills being proposed in the politically diverse state, the one that led to highly personal speeches from both Republican and Democratic lawmakers at a committee hearing last week. Now get this would simply increase the purchasing age to 21 for AR-15s and similar types of guns, impose penalties for possessing undetectable firearms, and allow for more limited concealed carry rights. That's what they were crying about. Republican lawmakers in Oregon said community safety depends on access to firearms, while Democrats conversely called for greater restrictions in the name of safety. The debate in the Oregon State Capitol comes as Democrats and Republicans across the country spar over gun rights, and as the number of gun violence deaths nationwide has risen to 11,767 so far this year, according to the Gun Violence Archive. Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The Biden administration is urging U.S. meat processors to make sure children are not being illegally hired to perform dangerous jobs at their plants. The call comes after an investigation found more than 100 kids working overnight for a company that cleans slaughterhouses, handling dangerous equipment like skull splitters and razor sharp bone saws. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack sent a letter yesterday, Wednesday, to the 18 largest meat and poultry producers, urging them to examine the hiring practices at their companies and of their suppliers as well. The letter is part of a broader effort by the administration to crack down on the use of child labor. The Labor Department has reported a 69% increase since 2018 in the number of children being employed illegally in the United States. Gee, I wonder what was happening then. Oh, children being kidnapped from their families at the border and left with no paper trail to find out where they are. Maybe we should be checking the employment records of these processors and maybe other companies that uh, have been using some child labor illegally. All right, that brings us to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. Hi, and welcome to Your Health Quickly, a Scientific American podcast series. On this show, we highlight the latest vital health news, discoveries that affect your body and your mind. Every episode, we dive into one topic 
We discuss diseases, treatments, and some controversies. And we demystify the medical research in ways you can use to stay healthy. I'm Tanya Lewis. I'm Josh Fishman. We're Scientific American Senior Health Editors. Today we're talking about coffee. We hear a lot of conflicting findings about whether our favorite beverage is good or bad for our health. But recently, an especially rigorous study came out that may finally answer some of our percolating questions. There's a good chance that right now you're sipping the very thing we're talking about. Coffee. It is one of the most widely consumed beverages in the entire world. It's true. Here in the U.S., the average person drank almost 89 gallons of coffee in 2016, more than soda, tea, and juice combined. That's a lot of java, or joe, brew, or jitter juice, whatever you like to call it. Indeed. Do you drink coffee, Josh? Actually, I guess I'm one of the few people who doesn't. I used to guzzle it, though, about four to five cups a day. But I gave it up a few years ago. Why? What happened? Honestly, my stomach started getting upset. I figured I could do without so much acid, you know? That totally makes sense. But personally, I'm not really functional until I've had my morning cup of coffee, and I don't know if I could give that up. There are times when I catch the aroma from a coffee shop and it just smells so good. But listen, I'm still not sure that coffee was causing my problems. It feels like every day there's a new study telling us coffee is good for us, or bad for us for a whole bunch of different reasons. With all these conflicting messages, it can really feel like whiplash. Well, it turns out it's actually really hard to study how coffee or any other food or drink affects our health. Most nutrition studies are observational studies, which compare health outcomes in people who, say, happen to drink coffee to those who don't. But it's impossible to rule out other variables that could affect what you're trying to measure. Plus, you have to rely on people reporting what they consumed weeks or months after they drank it. And most of us can't even remember what we had for breakfast. So what's the solution? Is there another way to study this? Well, there is a way to be more objective. I talked to... Gregory Marcus, uh, professor of medicine and cardiologist at University of California, San Francisco. Marcus and his colleagues took a different approach than most other coffee studies. Instead of just studying people who drank coffee or didn't, he set up a randomized trial to study coffee's impact on your heartbeat. They were looking for abnormal heart rhythms called arrhythmias. The topic comes up very frequently in my clinic, where patients with various arrhythmias uh, will ask if they can consume coffee. There's this conventional wisdom that coffee increases the risk for heart rhythm disturbances or electrical problems with the heart, which is my clinical subspecialty. And yet we and others in conducting recent observational studies generally have failed to find a clear association between coffee and arrhythmias. In their new study, Marcus and his colleagues randomly assigned 100 people to either drink or not drink coffee each day for a period of two weeks. And they received these instructions via text message. They were randomly assigned to either go ahead and drink all the coffee you want versus on other random days, avoid all caffeine today. They had participants wear a heart monitor, a Fitbit, and a continuous glucose monitor. They also had them download an app on their phone that collected GPS location data so the researchers could see when people were actually visiting coffee shops. With the heart monitors, what were they looking at? They were measuring two things. The number of what are called premature atrial contractions and premature ventricular contractions. It's very common for everyone to have an early beat arising from the upper chambers of the heart called premature atrial contractions or PACs once in a while. But research has shown that having too many of these beats puts you at risk of atrial fibrillation, which is a dangerously irregular rapid heartbeat. This is associated with a very high risk for stroke, dementia, and death. Then there's the other kind of irregular heartbeat. Premature ventricular contractions are early beats that arise from the lower chambers of the heart. Again, we all have those sometimes, uh, but those with more are at higher risk of developing heart failure or weakening of the heart. They found that drinking coffee did not result in more premature atrial contractions, the early heartbeats associated with atrial fibrillation. That's good news for people who are worried about that. 
That is reassuring. But what about the other bad beats, the premature contractions in the heart's lower chambers? Those were slightly more common on days when people were told to drink coffee, or on days when they drank more coffee, but not enough to be really worrisome. And that's not all they found. Coffee consumption was also associated with a higher number of daily steps. On days when people drank coffee, and the more coffee they drank, the more steps they took. On days randomized to coffee, people took on average about a thousand more steps, which is highly significant. And in fact, that difference in average steps has been associated with the improved uh, longevity uh, in large epidemiologic studies. The study couldn't show why people increased their steps on days when they drank coffee. Maybe they were just walking to the coffee shop or the bathroom more. But regardless, an extra thousand steps per day has been linked to a 6 to 15 percent lower risk of death in other studies. So coffee might actually make people perk up and move around. Yep, I guess the coffee drinkers were full of beans. But there was a downside to drinking coffee, and it probably won't surprise you. Uh, let me guess. People slept less. Bingo. The study participants got about half an hour less sleep on average on the days they drank coffee compared with the days they didn't. But the results varied a lot from person to person depending on whether they were fast or slow coffee metabolizers, which is determined by your genetics. The researchers gave participants a genetic saliva test to determine which type of coffee metabolizer they were. The fast caffeine metabolizers, as inferred from their genetics, actually exhibited no significant relationship between coffee consumption and sleep, whereas the slow caffeine metabolizers exhibited the worst effects on on sleep. In fact, the slow caffeine metabolizers on on average uh, had almost an hour less sleep when they were exposed to coffee. I never had an issue with sleep when I was drinking a lot of coffee, but I wake up at a ridiculously early hour in the morning. I'm talking five o'clock, so I'm usually zonked by 10 p.m. anyway. Yeah, I don't usually find that coffee keeps me up at night either, but I try not to have caffeine after about 3 or 4 p.m. Still, this study has me wondering if I should quit drinking it earlier in the day. If someone suffers from insomnia, we have found here in a randomized trial that there's, there are meaningful effects on sleep to such a degree that it really should motivate a good trial off of coffee to really try to tackle insomnia. Okay, that part is pretty much a no-brainer. But overall, the study does seem like fairly positive news for those who enjoy their brew. Yeah, it is pretty good news. It confirms other observational studies that have not shown a higher risk of heart arrhythmias. And some studies have shown that drinking coffee is linked with a lower lifetime risk of diabetes and death overall, which could be a result of the higher activity levels that drinking coffee might produce. In the end, there may not be a simple answer to the question of whether coffee is good or bad for you. It depends on how much you consume, and each person is different. On the whole, these data should be generally reassuring regarding the safety of coffee. But one of the challenges in conducting nutrition-based research is that there tends to be a a kind of a natural hunger, especially from the media, but I think this is just human nature, to conclude, okay, is this good for me or is this bad for me? Which one is it? It's one or the other. And the reality is that the effects of coffee are complicated. Coffee affects each person differently. So if drinking coffee makes you feel bad, skip it. But if, like me, you enjoy it in moderation, Go ahead and have that latte. Your Health Quickly is produced and edited by Kelso Harper, Talika Bose, and Jeff Delvisio. Our music is composed by Dominic Smith. Our show is part of Scientific American's podcast, Science Quickly. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to go to Siam.com for updated and in-depth health news. I'm Tanya Lewis. I'm Josh Fishman. We'll be back in two weeks. Thanks for listening. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetrootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. 
And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our Secure Donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. For more than 150 years before 1776, the American colonists had grown used to little direct interference by Parliament in colonial affairs. This policy was known as salutary neglect. The term comes from a speech by Edmund Burke, given in the House of Commons in 1775. He said, When I know that the colonies in general owe little or nothing to any care of ours, and that they are not squeezed into this happy form by the constraints of watchful and suspicious government, but that through a wise and salutary neglect, a generous nature has been suffered to take her own way to perfection. When I reflect upon these effects, when I see how profitable they have been to us, I feel all the pride of power sink, and all presumption in the wisdom of human contrivances melt and die away within me. My rigor relents. I pardon something to the spirit of liberty. However, the Seven Years' War of 1756 to 1763 forced the British to incur many debts. To make matters worse, Britain faced pressure to reduce taxes in Britain. Parliament therefore sought to increase taxes and its control over America, which led to discontent among the colonists. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics where civic education only takes a minute. Book banning is at an all-time high. Listen up. This matters. I'm Lewis Black, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute with ACLU attorney Bill Newman. The highest since the ALA, that's the American Library Association, began tracking this data 20 years ago. Twice as many bans in 2022 as in 2021, a year that itself had set an all-time high. Years ago, a local parent or community member might demand that a book be taken off the shelf. Now, there are demands for multiple removals, sometimes hundreds of books at a time. Demands often made by organized groups, many national, that have a political or a social agenda. A few books have been challenged because they have racist language, but the vast majority of the books being targeted have LBGTQ themes. These groups don't want people to read these books. The director of the Library Association's Office for Intellectual Freedom is quoted in the recent AP story as saying that the last two years, quote, have been exhausting, frightening, and outrage-inducing. And the story is getting worse. Bills that do or may facilitate the restriction of books in public libraries and or schools have passed and or are pending in many states, including Iowa, Texas, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Florida, among others. Apparently, the 21st century crusade of book banning has only just begun. That's a fearful prospect, which speaks volumes. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the American Civil Liberties Union because freedom can't defend itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1903. That was the day that 25 delegates from 17 cities gathered in Washington, D.C. to discuss forming a union for laborers. General laborers, who often perform some of the most backbreaking work on projects like digging canals and surfacing streets, were often blocked from joining craft unions as full members. The laborers in D.C. decided it was time to join together and formed the International Hod Carriers and Building Laborers Union. That was the beginning of the union that today is called the Laborers International Union of North America, or LIUNA. The union published its first constitution in English, German, and Italian, reflecting the diversity of the members that they represented. At the convention, the delegates issued a declaration of principles. 
In it, they declared, quote, We hold that all men are created free and equal, and that honor and merit makes the man, and that self-preservation is the first law of nature, and that he who would be free must strike the first blow. They then went on to describe their purpose, writing, quote, First, to gather under one grand banner all of those who toil on buildings with our craft and calling. Second, to promote by all honorable means the social and financial standing of all those who wish to partake in the fruits of amalgamation. Third, to create general agitation for the purpose of making a universal eight-hour day to increase the wages of members of the craft. Fourth, to establish a system of conciliation and arbitration in different sections of our land. Fifth, to help members of the craft in securing lawful and profitable employment. For more than a century, Lyuna has fought for the rights of laborers. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon, on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 29 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of around 60, though, later on today. Mostly cloudy skies this morning, though it is quite clear at the moment, and it will become partly cloudy this afternoon. Highs, again, will be near 60, winds light and variable. We did have a freeze warning overnight, and it is still crusty outside as we speak. Some clouds tonight with lows in the low 30s. Winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And then some clouds in the morning tomorrow will give way to mainly sunny skies for the afternoon. Highs in the mid-60s. Winds light and variable. Pollen is still rated none. And the reason for it is because of our fairly uh, humid, wet, chilly mornings. So if I take a reading in the afternoon, it may give us a pollen reading. But in the morning, we have none still. The air quality index for the region is in the good range at 17 parts per million. And that daytime UV index is moderate at level four. So still take care, of course. Barometric pressure is falling rapidly at 30.12 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles and Relative humidity is at 100%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 54 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 55 and partly cloudy with a wind advisory. Rome is 55 degrees with showers in the vicinity and also with their own wind advisory. Kiev is 52 degrees and cloudy. Kabul is 63 and clear. Hong Kong is 74 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 60 degrees and fair. Sydney, Australia is 63 and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 50 degrees and sunny. And New York, New York is 85 degrees Fahrenheit, sunny with a weather statement on a red flag day to take care for fire danger. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world.
Jamie Keaton of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Switzerland's lower house of parliament issued a searing, though symbolic, rebuke yesterday, Wednesday, of an emergency plan spearheaded by the executive branch to prop up embattled Credit Suisse and shepherd it into a takeover by Swiss banking rival UBS. The National Council, through an unusual left-right alliance, voted twice over the last day to reject the government guarantees that were authorized last month. The votes took place in a special parliamentary session that wrapped up yesterday Wednesday to scrutinize long-running troubles at Credit Suisse, a 167-year-old bank that was a pillar of Swiss finance and the government's plan to save it from a collapse that could have shaken the global financial system. Switzerland's main right-wing party opposed tighter regulations on banks while centrists favored tougher rules but would accept state help for banks in some cases. Left-leaning parties that have long decried Overly dangerous banks were insistent on stricter limits on bonuses for top executives and requirements for more money to be kept on hand by the biggest lenders. The whole discussion centered on whether more regulation was needed, in particular to the leverage ratio, and severely regulate bonuses of the managers of the big, systematically important banks, socialist lawmaker Roger Nordman said. Finance Minister Karen Keller Sutter, who has been at the epicenter of a political firestorm around the three and a quarter billion dollar Credit Suisse UBS deal, told lawmakers that capital requirements would be increased. Then you can start from the premise that big banks will face more severe restrictions. Je te donne, c'est mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Associated Press staff brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Colombian President Gustavo Petro said yesterday, Wednesday, that he had removed the national police director who had talked about using exorcisms to catch fugitives. Neither Petro nor Defense Ministry elaborated on reasons for the dismissal of General Henry Sanabrea, a staunch Catholic who was appointed by Petro in August of last year. But Sanabrea was under an internal investigation by the ministry over whether he had inappropriately allowed his religious beliefs to infringe on his duties. Sanabrea had unleashed a debate about the impact of his faith on the police after his statements in an interview last month and including that police had used exorcisms to catch drug kingpins and guerrilla leaders. He also issued a strong condemnation of abortion, which is legal in Colombia. Although Colombia is a predominantly Catholic country of conservative and religious traditions, it is a secular state under its constitution. Petro, who was sworn in as the country's first ever leftist president last August, said that Sanabrea would never be persecuted over his religion, but that there must be separation between religious beliefs and the state. Wow. Sounds like what America wanted to be one time in the past, doesn't it? Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for 
Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver